you better get the lights. lights. You know the lights back here, up here. No, don't do those back there. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Can you all hear that okay? You all right in the back, Taylor? Good. Good morning, everyone. Excellent. You're still awake even after a donut. Those donuts are worth the drive. I look forward to them. It's great to be with you and um, have the chance to visit just a little bit. Um, um, they asked me to talk about EPDs. I'm going to take maybe just a little different approach. We will talk about EPDs, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about bull selection and incorporate EPDs along with that and tell you a few things that are new relative uh, uh, to EPD and bull selection and, and move through this uh, hopefully fairly quickly. If you've got questions as we go, holler those out, stand up. Mike Henry down here will throw something at me, uh, anything, and, and be happy to, uh, if we need to divert and talk about some other things, that's great with me. But we're going to talk about bulls, and why we talk about bulls, I think we all recognize this, but uh, for you folks that are cow-calf producers, which is most of you in the room, uh, from a genetic perspective, that's the only way we make change is bull selection. Okay? Many of us are relatively limited in terms of our cow herd size. Many of us run one or two bulls. And we're putting all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak, from a genetic perspective. Uh, those genetics, as you know, have an awful lot to do with the performance of our cows, the weaning weights of our calves, the grade of our calf, how much those calves bring when we sell them, and ultimately our profitability. So it's extremely important um, that we visit about this and, and, and think about it from a bull selection perspective. So what I'm going to do today or this morning is, is I've got a 10-step process, all right? I'm a, I watch David Letterman on occasion. All right, this is the top 10, okay? Top 10 things to do to keep in mind um, to be successful in bull selection, okay? The first two or three, I'll admit to you, are not any fun, all right? They're not very much fun. It's not near as much fun as opening a bull sale catalog or looking at pictures or talking about EPDs and those kind of things, but probably the first two or three steps are the most important, okay? The first one is identify what your goals are, all right? What in the world are you using this bull for? Why do we have him in the first place? So what do you suppose my first question, I, I asked Cynthia when she called me to, to do the program, I said, sure, where's it gonna be? Um, she told me the, the AREC, and I've been here several times, but the first time she told me that, I said, uh, where's that at? What do you suppose her question back to me was? Yeah, where am I? Where am I coming from? All right? Same thing with bulls. All right? As you think about your bulls, what bull do you need? Well, the, the most important answer to that question is, what do you currently have? What needs improvement? All right? So setting up a foundation in terms of what your goals are, where you've been, where you're headed, those are really fundamentally important. As many of you know, I work with the bull tests, and I get lots of calls. And the most routine question I get is, which is the best bull in the sale? <laughs> it's none of you in this room. It's your neighbor, right? Because you all laughed at that, at that. All right? What's the best bull? Well, the best bull for what? I mean, there's, we're selling 140 of them. There's hopefully 140 best bulls in there uh, to meet various needs. So defining what we're doing from a goal standpoint. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I want you all to think about that uh, because it's fundamentally important as we talk about some of the tools. So with our goals, we can assess where we are. What's our strengths and weaknesses? What are we good at? What do we need to improve? Okay? And we could use lots of examples on both sides of the equations. I've just thrown a few up. Uh, perhaps we're good at weaning weight. Calve and ease are not an issue. We've got a good milk and set of cows. The grader tells us they're the right kind in terms of frame and muscle and color, all those things. We're excellent managers. Perhaps we've got some problems with uniformity. Perhaps we've got some problems with cow size. We're afraid our cows are getting a little big. Maybe we've got some feedlot data back through one of your cooperative programs, and perhaps we could do a better job marbling. Perhaps we could do a better job with some of the things Chris talked about, feed and forage. Those aren't genetic. Those are management. Um, and we'll talk about that importance here in just a minute. Ultimately, it all boils down to your bottom line, okay? Strengths, weaknesses, goals, all that ties into bull selection. Ultimately, are you making money or not? Your bulls certainly play a role in that. 
amongst other things. But having this information and thinking about it uh, is certainly really, uh, really important. One of the things I'd like to leave with you is a pretty important concept, okay? We all get paid on performance, right? Most of you in the room get paid on how many calves you sell, times what they weighed, times what they brought per pound, correct? All right? There's two components to that. One of those genetic, which I'm going to focus on, okay? So that calf's got an inherent ability to grow, to reach a certain weight at a certain age, okay? To mash down the scales and generate you more dollars, okay? But there's another side to it. There's the environment side, okay? That's your management, your forage resources, your nutritional program, all those things, okay? While those two things are independent, genetics and management, okay, the two of them together is what we get paid for, all right? Because we can have great genetics and be moderate in terms of management, and we're not going to realize the genetic potential of our calves. The flip of that's true as well. We can be the best manager in the world, but if we don't have the genetics to support a little additional growth, a little extra additional milk in our cows, we're not going to have it. Okay? So they're both tied together, so performance or what we get paid for is both your genetics and your environment, and those two uh, certainly are, are intertwined, and we'll talk some more about that as we, uh, we go through here just a little bit. So with those things in mind, we can establish what our priorities are. That's our third step. Okay, go back to my example. So if we're thinking about bull selection in this particular herd, given this hypothetical example, we want to maintain our strengths. So we kind of want to stay where we're at in growth and calving ease and maternal ability. We certainly don't want to go backwards, but we're not necessarily interested in a bull that needs to take us a long ways forward. Conversely, our weaknesses, from a genetic standpoint, we want to moderate mature size. So maybe we're going to look at bulls that are a little smaller framed without giving up growth. Those bulls are out there. We're going to place some emphasis on marbling because of some feedback we've gotten. What are we going to do about uniformity? Are we going to change that with our bull? Likely not, okay? Depending on what uniformity is, if uniformity is calf size, that's probably a bigger function of calf age, maybe a calving season that's pretty long. Consequently, we have various ages of calf. Uh, it's awfully hard to make those calves match. If, they got a, if we have a six-month calving season, they're only going to be so uniform, okay? If we're talking about uniformity in terms of type, whether that's coat color or that's grade, we can do something about that from a genetic standpoint. So a little bit depends on if it's genetics or if it's management or if it's environment to address that. Okay? I want you to think about a couple other things that relate to all this. All right? We can change genetics. We have great tools, and we'll talk about those in more detail in a minute. But those tools and our genetics influence our bottom line in two ways. The one that we tend to think about the most and concentrate on the most is those traits that impact revenue. In other words, making calves weigh more, generating more dollars gives us more income. Okay? And we can do that through selection for growth. We can do that through selection for more, more milk in our cows. If we're retaining ownership or getting paid on some sort of carcass basis, we can generate higher quality grades, heavier carcass weights, all those kind of things, okay? These things are relatively easy to do. We have excellent tools to do it. And they're easy to use. Um, and we've done a great job with that. The more challenging part's the other side of the equation, okay? Remember that your income is offset by your expenses. Well, guess what? Those expenses also are highly related to genetics, all right? The genetics of your cow herd and your calf crop influence your cost of production. Okay, so when we make calves way heavier at more, more heavier at weaning, do you suppose all that weight comes free? It costs more to raise a heavier calf, does it not? Okay, the question is, does that additional income offset the additional expense? In a trait like weaning weight, most often it does. Okay, but all these traits here that have genetic control, whoops, reproduction, maintenance costs, in other words, how big are your cows and what's it, cost to maintain your cows. That's genetic. Okay. Bigger cows require more inputs and more feed resources simply to maintain them. We know that calving difficulty is genetic. How long a cow stays in the herd has a genetic component. 
feed efficiency, production costs like growth in milk, all these things influence your costs. Okay? So we talk an awful lot about optimums, and we'll get to that uh, as we discuss this. But think about both the input and the output side. Okay? Because they're both important from a genetic standpoint. Uh, and I guess the take home message when we look at this slide from, an, from a cost of production, bigger is not necessarily better. More is not always better from a cost standpoint. So really what we're after is trying to optimize those two as we've discussed, balancing performance parameters or productivity with cost of production. And that's probably a little easier said in a setting like this than it is uh, uh, as you folks try and put it to practice, but I think having that in the back of our mind is a key component relative to bull selection. Okay? Fourth step, we're going to get in the nuts and bolts of it. Fourth step is using the tools that we have to us to make proper bull selection. As many of you know, one of my favorite topics is this top one, which is crossbreeding. I'm not going to touch on that too much today. We know that a well-designed crossbreeding program is the way to go in a commercial cow-calf setting. Okay? Because of the huge advantages to a crossbred cow and reproductive efficiency, um, number of calves weaned, weight of calf weaned, all those kind of things. Okay? We also do it through EPDs and selection of bulls within breeds, and that's what we're going to concentrate on here in just a little bit. Of course, our tool to select those bulls is EPDs, which they asked me to focus on this morning. Okay? Do a little quick review uh, on EPDs. It's always good to, to reiterate these things. EPDs stand for Expected Progeny Differences. Okay? And the key word in that acronym to remember is difference. That's the key word. So if we've got two bulls here designated A and B and they have weaning weight EPDs of 50 and 30, okay, by definition what that EPD means is that there's 20 pounds difference between their EPDs. So if we use those two bulls on the same set of cows, manage the calves in the same fashion, on average, calves sired by bull A will be 20 pounds heavier than calves sired by bull B. That's what EPDs tell us. Yes, ma'am. What, what is the baseline for the plus 50 and the plus 30? Uh, I understand. Excellent question. Getting there. Right. Getting there. Okay. I've shown in this slide as an example, and this is strictly example. That means that if bull A sires calves that weigh 600 at weaning, bull B will sire calves that weigh 580 on average. Okay. Now keep in mind, do the EPDs tell us what the calves are going to weigh? Not at all. What, what influences what the calf will weigh? Genetic merit of your cows and your management and environment. Okay? But the important thing is, bull A could sire 700 pound calves. That means on the same system, bull B would sire calves that weigh 680. The relative difference remains the same, okay? regardless of what actual performance is. Where do they come from? All right? EPDs are generated from several different uh, sources of information. We're going to talk about a couple new ones today. All, all bulls start with an EPD before they're born. All right? We can simply take the EPD of their sire and dam and average them, get a pedigree estimate. From the pedigree, we incorporate the bull's own performance. In other words, for the trait like weaning weight, what did that bull weigh at weaning? How did he relate to the calves he was raised with? What was his ratio? In this case, I've used the example. He ratioed 115, which means he's 15% heavier than the calves he was raised with. That tells us he's got more genetic merit than his pedigree estimated, so we bump his EPD up a little bit. And ultimately, in some cases, those bulls will sire progeny, okay? And their progeny records becomes part of their prediction of their EPDs, the proof's in the pudding, so to speak, and we further adjust their EPDs. Now keep in mind, I've shown here in this example, this bull's EPDs got higher. Half of them, they get lower, okay? Or they go down. So all those sources of information that are available, that's done in what's called a national cattle evaluation by the various breeds, um, and primarily uses um, seed stock records to make those calculations, okay? I think most of you are familiar with the four primary EPDs that have been around the longest. All right, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, and milk. Birth weight, of course, reflects differences in weight at birth. In this example, it's 1.7 pounds is the difference, okay? 
The second bull there, the negative 0.4 bull, will sire calves which are lighter at birth. Consequently, we would expect his calves to be born easier. We commonly use birth weight as a heavy selection tool on bulls that we're going to use on heifers because of calving difficulty. We talked about weaning weight already. Yearling weight is weight at a year of age. Generally speaking, weaning and yearling will be highly correlated. Bulls that weigh, uh, have strong EPDs at weaning also have strong EPDs at yearling because growth generally tends to be the same at those two stages of life. And then, of course, a milk EPD, which is our estimate of that bull's daughter's ability to milk. Remember, it's the bull's daughters. Okay, if we keep daughters out of the bulls, out of these two sires, we'd expect their daughters to wean calves which are five pounds heavier because they milk better. Okay, it's not pounds of milk, it's pounds of calf. All right, pounds of calf weaning as a result of milk is what the EPD predicts. Okay, a relatively new one, well, not new so much anymore, is calving ease EPD. Calving ease, uh, by definition, all right, reflects differences between sires and the ability of their calves to be born unassisted. So in this particular example, an 8 versus a 12, okay, that's a difference of 4. Calving EPDs are expressed in percent, so that's 4% difference. So if we'd mate those two bulls to a set of heifers, calve them as first calf heifers, we'd expect the heifers bred to bull 118 or the higher calving ease bull 4% more of them will calve unassisted, okay? as opposed to the other bull, which will have more heifers which we have to assist. Okay? So the question comes up an awful lot, should we be using birth weight or calving these EPDs if we're looking for heifer bulls? All right? So if you want to think about it and think through this with me, which trade are we interested in, birth weight or calving ease? We're interested in calving ease. We could care less what they weigh, right? If they're born by themselves and they get up and nurse, they could weigh 100 pounds. The important thing is the heifer has it, and we don't have to assist it, and everything's good. So calving ease is what we're really after. So it's the trait that's of economic relevance to us. Now, keep in mind those two things are highly related, calving ease and birth weight, because what are most calving problems caused in heifers? Calf is too big for the pelvic opening. Okay. So the, either the pelvis is too small, or the calf's too big, or a combination of the two. And in most cases, it's calf size, generally associated with calf weight. So most bulls that you see, if you look up their, uh, their EPDs, low birth weight bulls gender, tend to be high cavities bulls, and vice versa. Now there are exceptions to the rule, and that's where cavities really helps us. Okay identify those bulls that even though they're low birth weight, for whatever reason, they're not necessarily easy calving. Okay, So I'd certainly use calving ease as your primary trait uh, when selecting bulls for heifers because that's what we're really after um, in terms of its uh, importance to us from a production standpoint. Okay. So we've got all these EPDs and, and create some challenges. One of those, if we go back to some of our first slides and our first steps, we talked about the importance and economic relevance of these traits. So when we sit down and look at EPDs, how in the world do we begin to balance them? In other words, I know calving ease is important. I know weaning weight's important. I know milk's important. I want to improve those or keep them the same. How in the world do I make trade-offs? Okay, and what's more important? couple percent more cavities or five more pounds of weaning weight? That's a very difficult question to answer, okay? But we've come up with some tools in the industry to help us do that, uh, and I wanted to share those with you and, and answer any questions that you might have. So what we have now is what we call these index EPDs, and I think many of you have seen them and are familiar with them. But an index EPD simply is a combination of various individual EPDs that all go into... Um, have economic importance for a general trait of interest. Okay? And what we do statistically is we take those EPDs, we weight them accordingly, we assign a dollar value to them or economic value to them, put all that in a pot and come up with a single number, a single EPD that you can use as a selection tool to take a whole suite of EPDs or several EPDs at once and move them in a favorable direction. Okay? So, crowd interaction time. Let's assume that you're using a bull 
All right, you're going to sell your calves at weaning. You're going to retain heifers to keep back in your herd as replacement. You're going to use this bull on heifers to some extent. Which one of those bulls would you buy? How many vote A? How many vote B? Not everybody voted. Let's do that again. <laughs> Nobody's recording your vote. How many vote A? How many vote B? A wins. Okay. So think about this. How did those of you in the audience derive your answer? How did you intuitively say that bull A is better? All right. I mean, he's better in calf and ease, unquestionably. But he doesn't have as much milk or much growth, but he has more milk. Those of you that bull, voted bull B are putting his growth in favor of those other traits, right? Okay. So the question becomes, how do you balance those? How do you translate it into dollars and cents? Very difficult thing. Well, the good news is we have some tools to do that. This index EBE, dollar W or dollar wean calf value, answers that question that we just asked. Okay. Dollar W is designed to use in that scenario where we're going to sell um, calves at weaning or around weaning. We're going to retain our own heifers. Okay. It also takes into consideration cost of cows, milk production, cost of milk production, cost of the size of the cow, etc. So that dollar W value then is expressed in dollars and cents. And in this example, these are not the two bulls that I just showed you, but a different, just hypothetically. If we've got two bulls and their dollar Ws are 30 and 20 with a $10 difference, what that EPD tells us is that if we use those two bulls in our herd, we sell calves at weaning, we retain replacement heifers, over time, each calf sired by bull A is going to be worth $10 more in that system than, than the calf sired by bull B. Why? Because he has a better combination of calf and ease, growth, maternal ability, and cost structure, or um, is more economically efficient. All right? So let's go back to our slide. Anybody want to change your vote? Okay. Anybody want to change your vote? The truth of the matter is, those bulls are identical. Okay. So there's no right answer to the question I asked you. All right. Based on their index, what that tells us is those two bulls are essentially the same in terms of their overall profitability. Okay. Looking at their EPDs, they get there a little differently, but they're the same. Okay, dollar W can be a great tool to help us answer these questions. Okay, and I think I'm, I'm very much the same as you all. If you gave me those those in a bull sale catalog, I'd make decisions. Okay, about those bulls being quite different, uh, but in truth, in that scenario that we just talked about, the dollar W value tells us they're about the same. Yes, Chris. Great question. Accuracy is what you're talking about? I, I guess yep. The Getting there. <laughs> Great question. You got really confused you in a minute. <laughs> All right. Good question. So the other popular index value is dollar beef in Angus. Okay. Dollar W is also in Angus. Um, several breeds have similar EPDs, like Simital has an API, an all purpose index, which is very similar. It's a dollar W in Angus. Dollar beef in Angus is a terminal, it's a terminal sire or a feedlot carcass trait dollar value. Okay? So what dollar beef tells us is the difference in profitability of calves out of sires, assuming that we put those calves in the feedlot, we sell them on a grade and yield carcass basis, all right? Differences between the bulls again are expressed in dollars per head. In this case, bull A is better. If we feed calves out of bull A, they're going to be $10 more profitable in a feedlot and carcass merit system than calves out of bull B. Why? They tend to grow faster, are more feed efficient, have more marbling, and hang heavier carcasses. Okay? In general, that suite of traits is more desirable. Okay? So dollar beef can also be, um, be a valuable tool, and we'll talk about that. Primarily, it's growth and carcass EPDs. 
Okay. To get to your question, ma'am, um, a couple of things. Let's keep in mind that EPDs only predict the average performance of the calf crop. All right. So what I've got here is the distribution and weaning weights that we'd expect when we use two bulls. Okay. Bull A in red has an EPD of 30. Bull B in blue has an EPD of plus 50 for weaning weight. Okay. Both those bulls will sire a bell-shaped curve when it comes to calf weights. Right? Think about that. Intuitively, we all know that. Okay? Not every calf weighs is plus 30. Okay? Some are plus 10. Some are plus 40. Okay? That they fit on the bell-shaped curve. What the EPD tells us is the average. Okay? So keep in mind that even through selection, and this goes to answer Chris's question a little bit, the better calves out of the lower EPD bull are going to be better than the poorer calves out of the higher EPD bull. That's just mother nature. Okay? What genes does that calf happen to get? Okay? EPDs predict the average, okay? which is all we can really do from a selection standpoint. But keep in mind there is a range. And that's why when we use heifer bulls, even when we do a great job, guess what? We still have to pull some because not all of them are low birth weight. Okay? Mother Nature samples our genes, and, and on occasion, we get some that are on the edges of these bell-shaped curves in both a favorable and unfavorable way. Okay? So, accuracy. What is accuracy? And this gets exactly what um, Dr. Toysh is asking. All EPDs come with an accuracy value. All right? That accuracy value tells us about the reliability of that EPD. Okay? It's an indicator of risk. All right? And that accuracy value is indicative of how much information we have to calculate that EPD for that trait. As we get more information, the accuracy value goes up. With little information, the accuracy value goes down, or is low. It doesn't go down. Um, accuracy values range from 0 to 1. Okay? An accuracy value of 0, by definition, means that that EPD is a wild guess. It's like... Mike Henry writing down a value on a piece of paper, all right? They don't exist, all right? Zero. An accuracy value of one means that with 100% certainty, the EPD we publish is 100% right. We never know that with 100% accuracy, okay? So we'll talk about the practical range in between. So generally speaking, yearling bulls, bulls that are young, we just have their pedigree information and their own performance or accuracy values of 0.3 and lower. For a bull to get above 0.4 and higher, he has to have progeny. Okay? So most of the bulls you guys are going to buy, yearling bulls, are going to be relatively low accuracy with some differences amongst those, those accuracies, which we'll talk about. Okay? What does this mean in a practical standpoint? I'm trying to walk you through to help you understand that. Sire A and B here both have identical birth weight EPDs, all right? They're both one. We would consider both of them heifer bulls because that's a relatively low birth weight EPD in Angus. The difference being that Sire A is a 25% accuracy, Sire B is 0.9, okay? What those accuracy values mean is that we would expect as we get more information on Sire A, based on his, his accuracy, his EPD could go up or down two pounds. Okay? He could get better or worse by two pounds as we garner more information on him. Sire B, on the other hand, is only going to go up or down 0.3 pounds because he's already a high accuracy bull. We've already got that data. Okay? So if we use the, the EPD and the possible change, we can calculate their range. So Sire A's range in his true EPD is negative 1 to 3. Sire B's range is only 0.7 to 1.3. Which bull would you use? B, all right? Much less risk. We know what his EPD is. That right there is the reason that we AI heifers to high accuracy bulls because we take the guesswork out. We know what his EPD is. Consequently, we can predict calving ease. Uh, pretty well. Yes, sir. Is, is A's accuracy affected just by a lack of information? Or well, how, how would they boost that score? Okay. His accuracy value go, will go up as we get additional data. There's a couple ways to do that. 
uh, one of the primary one to move from 0.25 to 0.9, there's only one way, and that's to have progeny recorded on the bull. Correct. Right. Yep. So, correct. They will move, and the other thing that will move that accuracy value and his EPD is more information on not only that bull himself, but on his, but on his um, his relatives, his sire, his dam, and all those cattle that are related to him, because that's all part of his EPD calculation. Okay. So to put that in graphical format, all right, sire, the high accuracy bull, sire B in the last case is this bell-shaped curve in the middle with the solid line, and the dashed line is bull, uh, the other bull, which is lower accuracy, okay? So his possible, or his true EPD, which we never know, but if we knew his true EPD with 100% confidence, the high accuracy bull is in this range, the low accuracy bull is quite a bit broader, okay? So if we buy that bull and he happens to be negative three on the lower end of his possible change, what do we think then? That's great, right? But if he happens to be a higher birth weight bull than his EPD predicts, perhaps we're pulling a few more calves than we'd like to. Okay. The other way it can reflect that if we just put him on a percentile table, in red is the lower accuracy bull and green is the high accuracy bull. Okay. So that yearling bull, even though he's low birth weight, on average, what this tells us is that bull ranks in about the top third of the breed for birth weight, which is a good target for Cavanese. We're doing our job. But he could be the top 10% or he could be the bottom 30%, okay, depending on where he floats to. The high accuracy bull, the AI bull, he's right there. We know where his target zone is. He is not going to move. Okay. So it's about reliability, it's about risk. We could do the same thing for cavities and birth weight. We could do it for all traits, for, all that, for that matter. Okay. So before I totally confuse you, does that mean we should not use EPDs and low accuracy bulls? No. Okay. What's the alternative What's the better source of information than the bull's EPD? There isn't one, okay? So despite the fact that we have limitations in this on a yearling bull for Cavanese, on a trait like Cavanese, it is still our best tool. It's a lot better than his own birth weight. It's certainly, it's 50 times better than going out and looking at the bull, okay? We can't tell anything by looking at him, all right? It's better than any tool that we have. It's still our best tool, but there are some limitations. And again, to reiterate, or reiterate, that's why so many of us recommend and use synchronize our heifers and AIM to high accuracy bulls, not only for birth weight and cavities, uh, but also for the analogous traits that are important to us. Okay. So that accuracy, to put that in perspective, all right, when that bull's born, his pedigree estimates probably an accuracy of 0.05 or so. Okay? As we add individual performance to that, that accuracy goes up to somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3. Maybe as high as 0.35. All right? And to get up here 0.6 or 0.8, that's when we have to have progeny records. And you get up to 0 0.9, 0 0.99 as we read in the AI sires or AI catalogs, those bulls have got lots and lots of progeny all over the country, okay? And that's the only way you achieve that kind of accuracy and predictability is having lots and lots of records, okay? I wanted to, to interject at this point a few new tools because it relates to accuracy primarily is, is the reason I want to talk about it here. Um, we've got some new and exciting tools to help us in beef selection. One of those is genomics, all right? Genomics or DNA, and many of you have probably read an awful lot about this in uh, popular press, and it's, it's been out there and certainly a tool that, that has some opportunity for us. Okay, and I want to share a few thoughts with that and, and hopefully give you a broad understanding of, of how this works. Okay, 
So very much thanks to human science, we've adopted an awful lot of technology on the livestock side and specifically the beef cattle side relative to DNA technology. Okay? We first mapped the human genome, right? Now we've mapped the bovine genome and lots of other species. Okay? Science-wise, we have the technology to go in to beef cattle and figure out where are regions on the genome or what are, where are the genes in simple terms? Where are the genes that control weaning weight? Where are the genes that control cavities? Where are the genes that control marbling? Okay? We have the ability to do that. Okay? So we can use DNA technology then, take a DNA sample on a bull, evaluate his DNA, and associate his DNA profile with favorable genes or unfavorable genes for traits like cavities, wean and weight, milk production, etc. Okay? How does that happen? In simple terms, how that happens is that researchers have gone out and taken DNA on thousands and thousands of cattle okay? with actual performance records on them. All right? They scanned the genome, they identified their genes, they associated their gene differences with differences in performance. Okay? So then we take another animal, scan his genome, and compare his genome to what we know about the other population relative to those traits of interest. Okay? So those results are expressed in a table that looks something like this. And this is extremely busy, and I'll try and, and boil it down. This is actual data I got back yesterday from a set of bulls that are actually on test at the BCI test station. They're Angus bulls. Um, Zoetis is the company that did the genomics for us. Okay. I've got about 10 bulls listed here. Up here on the top, you'll see the various traits that we have genetic profiles available for in DNA. Starting with cavities, birth weight, yearling weight, RFI is residual feed to intake. It's a measure of efficiency. Dry matter intake, and a whole bunch of them. Okay. That's one of the things about genomics is that we actually can calculate genetic values for traits that we don't even have EPDs for. That's one of the, the advantages of it. Okay? What the numbers are in the boxes across the row for each bull is his percentile ranking in the breed for that trait. Okay? It's not an EPD. It's his percentile. Where does he rank in the Angus breed for his genomic merit, DNA merit, for this trait. So just look at Cavanese, all right? The third bull down ranks in the top 95% of the breed for Cavanese, okay? You all remember standardized test scores, right? All right, 90, top 95 is the, is the uh, positive way to say that. The honest way to say that is he's in the bottom 5% for Cavanese, all right? This bull down here, the second one from the bottom, is the top 15% of the breed for calving yeast, based on genomics. Okay? We can go over here to yearling weight, the third column over. Here's a bull that's 40th percentile. Here's one that's 90. Here's one in the top 1% of the breed for yearling weight growth, based on his genomics, his DNA. Okay? Now, how do we use this stuff? And this is the important thing I, I want to share with you and, and, and hopefully you'll take home to understand, all right? What happens, and this is just a copy of the previous slide, remember that historically and classically, EPDs are calculated from pedigree, we add the individual performance of the calf to it, and then he has progeny, and that's how his EPD comes about, and gradually as we go down the line, his accuracy improves with more data, okay? What we can do then, as we calculate his EPDs, if we get a DNA profile on the bull and use genomics, it just becomes another box of information over here, all right? These values from this slide, the previous slide, actually go into the EPD database, all right? And then are incorporated, just like we incorporate his own weaning weight, just like we incorporate the weaning weight of other calves from the same sire, okay? To become part of his EPD calculation. So we, as beef cattle producers, we don't even see that in the background. What we see is the EPD, okay? Genomics are just working in the background to supplement his EPD and hopefully make it more accurate. Uh, and in, it's another source of information for us uh, that enhances its value. And really the value of that 
is that what we'll see when you have bulls that have yearling bulls, for example, that are on test or in a performance test that have got their ultrasound data, they've got their yearling weights, all those things, and then we run genomics, those bulls will increase in accuracy about 10%. So instead of being 0.3 accuracy, they move up to 0.4 or 0.45, depending on the trait. Okay? So it's a great tool that's helped us a great deal. I guess philosophically I would share with you, um, in my opinion, looking at this alone can be somewhat misleading. Why? Because genomics don't account for the entire genetic merit of the animal. They only account for the genetic merit of the animal that we can measure with DNA. We can't measure all the DNA for every trait, I guess is a better way to put it. Okay? We know that weaning wake is controlled by probably 40 genes. All right? The genomics don't, don't predict all 40 genes. They predict the subset of genes. Okay? The EPD, on the other hand, predicts all 40 genes. So the EPD is what we want to use, and genomics can supplement that and hopefully, hopefully help us. Okay? So EPDs are not zero. And ma'am, to get to your question, we got into that slide now. Okay? So what's the basis 20 versus 30? Okay? What does that compare to? Well, this is Angus. In 1979, the average genetic merit for all these traits was zero. Okay? Because of genetic trend and selection now, at the current time, the average weaning weight EPD is, is closer to plus 50 as opposed to zero, and yearling weight's plus 85. Okay? All the breeds are a little bit different. Here's the breeds. All breeds have a different breed average, so having an understanding of those, they're usually printed in sale catalogs, etc., uh, to help us understand uh, what the average is. So zero is not average in the breed currently. Zero was average in the breed some time ago. It's not the current breed average. Okay. Our fifth step, we're halfway there on the downhill slide. Fifth step is establishing benchmarks. So we've decided what our goals are. We know what we're going to select for. We know which traits are important. All right. We understand EPDs. We know how to use them. How are we going to apply that to a bull sale catalog? Okay. Let's talk about setting the specifications. What's the benchmarks? In other words, if we want to improve growth, where are we going to set our benchmark or our goal? Okay. There's several ways to do that. One of those is you've got to have some records in order to help us do that. Uh, and one of the best ways to do that is to look at our current herd sire battery. You've all bought bulls and most of you got a registration paper on him, right? What do you do with the registration papers? Uh, if you put them in a file, fabulous, okay? All right, get that bull's registration paper back out and look at his EPDs, all right? Do that for the last two or three or four bulls you've been using. That's your, that's your guideline, okay? That's your benchmark or your baseline. That's where your herd currently is, all right? So if your average weaning weight EPD that you've been using lately is plus 40 and you decide it needs to be higher, well, it needs to be higher than plus 40, because that's where you currently are, okay? And you can even do a little better job with that. If you know his registration number, you can plug it in the computer or have one of your extension agents help you do that. If you have no idea, go to the breeder you bought him from, he'll know. He can give you his reg number. He can probably tell you what his EPDs are, okay? But we got to have a place to start. We got to have a baseline, all right? Got to know where we are if we're going to know where we're going to go. Uh, and then we can begin to, to set some benchmarks, okay? I think the best way to do that um, is using kind of breed percentile tables. That's a couple examples I want to show you. Um, I didn't realize this table is a little bit hard to see, perhaps. Um, but over here, generally for calving ease, we're probably going to select Angus bulls in the top 40% of the breed for calving ease and birth weight. That means they're plus 7 or better for calving ease. If we're going to use them on heifers, there's exceptions to that. Uh, but as a general rule, we're going to do that. You know, here's a benchmark for weaning weight and yearling weight. Breed average is somewhere around 46 or so for weaning, plus 84 or so for yearling. A lot of us, that's kind of our lower end in terms of where we want to be. Um, then we can go up to 100 pounds or so. 
we may or may not want to go up to 125 pounds of yearling weight based on mature size. Okay, that's a question you'll have to think about. Um, but notice I've drawn boxes here. All I'm doing is drawing boxes of acceptability. There's one for milk, kind of keeping them in the middle of the breed. We don't want ones that are real dry. We might not want the ones that are the, that are the wettest. Okay, because they require more nutrition. Perhaps we don't have the environment to support that. If we figure out we've been using low milk bulls, then perhaps we could bring in a really high milk bull and, and be okay. All right, dollar W. That's the one we talked about earlier. For most of us, we definitely want to keep that better than breed average. That means the bulls we're using are above average for that suite of traits which influence calf or profitability selling calves at weaning. How about dollar beef? All right, this is the one that we think an awful lot about. A lot of people select for it. I guess the question I would ask you folks is how much economic, how much economic incentive or how much economic uh, importance are carcass traits to you? How much do you get paid for carcass traits? Most of you in the room, that answer is what? Zero. Okay. Does that mean carcass traits aren't important? No, I like your answer. Okay. We all have a responsibility to produce beef product that is acceptable to consumers, that drives consumer demand. That's all of our jobs. Okay. But marbling, for most of you, is not going to be your first selection criteria nor should it be, okay? You get paid on other things, all right? But at the same time, we don't want to produce cattle that go to the guy in the feedlot that don't work, that don't grow, that don't grade, that don't marble, etc. So we, most of all, we need to make sure we avoid the bad ones. And that's why I've drawn this box pretty big and liberal, but I've basically just cut off the bottom 30% of the bulls for dollar beef, and I don't want to buy them. Even though I'm not getting paid for it, the guy on the other end who buys my calves is getting paid for it. And guess what? He knows how my calves do. And that feeds back to me the next time I sell them. Okay? I'm getting into the marketing talk now. That's dangerous water for me. Okay? But think about that a little bit. And that's why that box is fairly big. I mean, it's okay if they're really good in dollar beef and got everything else. But we're not going to start on this side of the slide from a selection standpoint and move that way. We're likely going to start on the left and move to the right. Taylor. Different shape in terms of uh, the range of the um, Perhaps we'd ratchet that up just a little bit, depending on, you know, I, I guess I'm reading between the lines of nature of your question. If you move to a breed that doesn't have as much marbling, yeah, I think there'd be justification in moving that up, yes. Particularly if we had evidence that marbling is an issue. Okay. The flip side of that is that if improving a marbling is a primary, primary priority, we're probably using Angus bulls to do that and not, not another breed. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, let me go back to this. To, yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Okay, so hypothetically, if we, if we select a bull that's in the top 10% of the breed for weaning weight and yearling weight, what's going to come with that? Is he going to be a high or low birth weight bull? Generally speaking, he's going to be an above average birth weight bull. Okay, so birth weight and growth, for example, is a simple example to your question, okay? So how do we avoid that? Well, I think to go back to a couple other slides and comments, the more we can optimize and stay in the middle without going to extremes on either end, the less influence we'll see 
in those correlated traits. Okay? So on a young bull that's unproven, all right, that's got a yearling weight of 140 and a calf and ease, or a, a birth weight of negative two, and he's low accuracy, the law of averages in Mother Nature says something's got to give. One of those is going to give. He's either not that much growth or he's got a lot more birth weight than that. Now, there are rare exceptions. There are exceptions to that, right? We see them in the semen catalogs all the time because those bulls are out there and they're highly proven, okay? But genetically, because of genetic relationships, Mother Nature didn't design cattle that way, okay? So they're going to... They're going to regress towards the mean is the proper term geneticists use. They're going to regress towards the mean. They're going to get, they're going to get poor, okay? So that's the reason I've drawn these boxes of acceptability. I'm going to get to an example in just a minute, sir, that, that might help you with that to answer that question. Uh, the other thing to answer that question is that those index EPDs we talked about, that takes care of those relationships for you. So keeping those in check certainly helps with that from the standpoint that these are, there's economic weightings assigned. So if we select for too much growth um, and too much birth weight and too much milk, that's a negative feedback from a cost standpoint. In other words, the, va the, economic, uh, the dollar value EPDs tend to optimize everything. Okay? tend to optimize all those traits that are important and keep them in balance, um, which is balance is really the key to avoiding um, having large swings and, and in, in any one particular trait. Okay, so let's talk about doing our homework. When you get ready to go to that bull sale, do your homework. We've already talked about many of these things. Okay, so how do we put these things in benchmarks into practice? All right, here's a scenario for you as an example. We're going to buy a heifer bull. We're going to keep replacements. We're going to sell feeder cattle. Right? That likely means that cavities and birth weight are our highest priority if we're going to breed them to heifers. They've got to meet the spec for that. And then we want to maintain growth. All right? And we want to maintain milk, depending on where we are, because we're keeping heifers. Okay? So we take this percentile table, and basically, as I mentioned before, we want our box or our window of acceptability to be in the top 40% of the breed for calf and he's in birth weight. He's a heifer bull. He's got to do that, okay? Growth-wise, we're going to be a little above average, but we don't necessarily need the bull in the top 10%, all right? And when you put those two things together, growth tends to take care of itself a little bit, and you're not going to find too many bulls that are way out of whack on growth, okay? Dollar W, because that's what we're really after, we're going to keep that as high as we can get it, okay? And we're also going to keep dollar beef in mind for the reasons that we talked about earlier. So I get out my bull sale catalog, and here's four bulls. This is just part of a page. You folks know there's lots of pages of them, all right? And I don't know how well you can see that, but these red X's are bulls that don't meet my specs for cavities. So there's only one bull out of those four that I even have an interest in because they don't meet my window of acceptability, Okay. So I go to the next step on the lot seven bull. He's got the right growth. He's got the right dollar values. He's a bull that has potential. Okay? I don't even look at the other three because they don't meet my specs. I don't care if they're the best looking bull you've ever seen in your life. They're not going to meet your specs. They're not going to do the job for you. Okay? My advice is do this at home before you ever look at a bull. And then the only bull that you look at is lot seven, unless your neighbor tells you to go buy lot five for him. Okay? But don't buy him for yourself because he doesn't meet your specs. Let's change the scenario. An Angus bull to use on semi gelvy cross cows. Okay? We're going to produce value-added feeder cattle like lots of you in the room are doing. All right? We might retain ownership on occasion. We're going to keep our own replacements. Growth is certainly important. Marbling is important. Milk is important. Frame size, keeping it moderate is important. Notice that Cavanese is no longer our priority. All right? So not that I'm necessarily going to avoid it, but it's not the first box I'm going to circle. Okay? Growth-wise, we're going to keep them a little above breed average. Again, we're going to go back to our benchmarks on bulls we've been using. Marbling's important. Dollar beef's important. Dollar W's important. Milk's important. So we're drawing our windows of acceptability. The bull we buy has got to fit all those boxes, somewhere in that box. 
Okay? We go to the same four bulls. These are the same four. Well, bull five still doesn't work based on growth. That bull does. The green boxes are acceptable. I'm just going through my specs on the, from the previous page. So I got three out of the four of them that work. Okay? They're all going to work, and there might be a little difference amongst them, but they're all in my window of acceptability. Now I can go look at them. All right? And if one of them we don't like, for whatever reason, I can kick him out. But at least the ones I got left on my list work. Okay? Finding a good source is important. Okay? Buy from a reputable breeder. Lots of those in our state and lots of them here in Southside, okay? Go look at the bull after you've done your homework on your catalog, all right? We know that there's traits that are economically important that are heritable. Coat color, we know that. What the bull looks like, his muscle score is heritable, all right? What the bull looks like has some correlation, it's heritable, with what his feeder cattle are going to look like. You buy a slab-slided, flat-muscled, Two-muscle bull, he's going to sire flat-sided, narrow-butted, two-muscle calves. Okay? Make a good investment's my ninth step. Okay? I'm running out of time, but uh, with the help of Matthew Miller, we put this slide together a couple years ago. Basically, for many of us that have a sizable number of cows, all right, when you boil down what it costs per cow to breed to a bull, Relative to your entire cow costs over an entire year, it's a very small part of your annual cow costs. Okay, we're talking about between $10 and $40, $50, depending on how many cows you have and what you pay for your bull. The difference in quality of bull that you can buy in our state between $1,500 and $3,500 is amazing and enormous. Okay, so your bull and your investment in bulls and genetics is a very, very small part of your investment or your annual cow costs. Keep that in mind as you're buying bulls. The other thing I want you to keep in mind, I'm gonna wear my other hat now, as a guy that works with seed stock breeders, okay? If you want good bulls as a commercial cattleman, the guy on the other end has gotta make a little money too, all right? And I'll tell you that guys cannot, seed stock guys cannot supply you with good bulls at $1,500 a piece. It costs way more than that to make a good bull. Last year, Bulls in our test station, and this is conservative estimate, the break-even sale price was $1,850. Bucks. All right, and that's very conservative. Okay? In other words, if he didn't bring at least that, he'd have been better off castrating him at weaning and sell him as a feeder calf. Okay? And there was l several bulls, lots of bulls around the state that brought less than that. Okay? So it's a two-way street. I'm not asking you to pay $7,000 for a commercial bull. In fact, I would not recommend it. All right, if you're going to pay that much, then invest in AI and synchronize them, and whatever that costs um, is probably better suited. Lastly, manage that new bull right. Okay, that's a little bit beyond the scope of, of my discussion today. Um, feed him, develop him. Don't turn, him, turn that yearling bull out with your mature bulls. All right, they'll eat his lunch and you'll have a broken leg. All right, keep him in. You know, multiple sire pastures, keep them with a like young bull, and make sure on an annual basis those bulls have a breeding soundness exam. All right. Dr. Whittier, I saw him walk in a minute ago, and he'd be happy to share with you additional information on, on breeding soundness exams. Uh, but very, very important to manage that bull and develop him right uh, and get an annual BSC uh, every year. With that, that concludes what I wanted to share. Is there any additional questions? Yes, ma'am. Everything you discussed, but you never mentioned Doxo, especially if you're going to keep the 10 and a half. That, that's not important. No, doc docility is important, absolutely. And it's heritable, and we have an EPD for it. Yeah. Okay? So we can use docility EPDs. Again, it would fit in the same, same scenario. Obviously, the bulls to avoid are the bulls that are really poor on docility EPD because they crazy cows make crazy calves, right? It's heritable. We know that. If we select for docility, we can make progress. So it's another, it's another tool in the toolbox, okay? It's heritable, and, and we know that. Yep. Yes, sir.
cannibal and the numbers look good on him. He's big headed and coarse yellow. For Cavanese? Yeah, well, if you if you um, if you study the research that's been done relative to cavities, number one, almost all calving problems occur in heifers, right? All right, and why does that happen? There's a mismatch between the size of the calf and the pelvic opening. All right, so obviously heifers that have bigger pelvises can have bigger calves, and vice versa. Okay. Most of the research data out there would support that the vast majority of the cause of calving problems is the calf is too big, physically too big, for the pelvic opening. Okay? A lot of research studies have been done to try, and, to try and attribute that weight difference to coarse bone, big footed, big headed, and there's a little bit of influence there, but the majority of the influence is calf weight. Okay. Majority of the influence is calf weight. If you've got your due date on that cow or half or whatever, a lot of the bulls now, your calves will be a few days early. Yep. When that due date hits, especially on the half, she don't calve. Every day she goes, that calf will get bigger if it's just like it would on the ground. And the longer she goes past the due date, the more likely she's going to have problems. Yep. I've always believed. Well, the reason, the reason a lot of bulls are low birth weight and high cavities is their short gestation length. That's the reason that they're born, born lighter. And that's, that's been well established. So to specifically answer your question, I'd use the EPDs and the tools that we have. That's the selection tool I'd use. It's awfully hard to look at a bull and tell if he's cavities. In fact, it's impossible. Exactly. But, in fact, I mean, bigger birth weight, they're bigger everywhere. Their head's bigger, their body's bigger, feet are bigger, etc. Yes, sir? Is there a good website to get, like, yearly average EPDs for each breed? Like, so, if, as you're doing your homework for the, the upcoming sale, you can compare it to, like, yep. Um, all the breed association websites have all that stuff. All the stuff I showed you is on every breed association website. And most all sale catalogs have breed average printed in them for the breeds that they're selling. Yep. Taylor? Um, Taylor's question is, so to go back to the genomics discussion, we can apply that genomic principle um, to our replacement heifers. In other words, we can draw, pull hair, draw blood on them, get the genomic profile, and use that as a selection tool. Of course, in commercial heifers, you're talking about commercial heifers, right, Taylor? Um, in commercial heifers, that's really the only genetic tool that, that we have, okay? because they don't have EPDs, right? All we have is the pedigree that we have on paper from the bulls that we've used to sire them and the bulls we've used to sire the cows, etc. So we have some idea, but we don't have any genetic, direct genetic predictors of the genetic merit of those heifers, okay? The challenge is, is that after we go through the exercise of getting rid of the little ones, the ones that were born too late, in other words, after we make our initial sort, we've got a group of heifers, right? to select our replacements from, correct? We've gotten rid of the stuff on the outside already, okay? So even if we have those genetic values, what are we gonna do? We're gonna throw out one or two more based on that, okay? Or a certain percentage, the other five or 10% um, bottom in. Right now, based on the cost of those EPDs or those, or those genetic profiles, um, you know, it's pretty tough to justify. Because then you got to, you know, the heifer then has to get pregnant, right? You've got a whole bunch of other steps in the process. 
And at the end of the day, how much genetic improvement have you really made getting rid of these, these 10% versus these 10% in the grand scheme of things in your herd? It's relatively minimal. So until that stuff gets pretty cheap, Taylor, and the other important part of the answer to that question is what are you getting paid for? Okay, And what does that tool bring to the table to help you get better at what you're getting paid for? Um, so it's a great technology, but right now um, I'd say its application is limited um, at the commercial level. With that, appreciate your attention. I will be around uh, for a while, certainly through lunch, um, and be happy to visit. Thank you. Turn off button here.